Hello, I'm Richard Saunders. Welcome to the Vaccination Chronicles. In this video, I'd like to tell you about a time in our history, not so long ago, when parents lived with the very real fear that at any time their children could succumb to the deadly effects of infectious diseases. I'd like to tell you what it was like back then, but I really can't. I wasn't there. I was born after the widespread introduction of vaccination for diseases such as pertussis, which is whooping cough, diphtheria, rubella, tuberculosis, and infantile paralysis, poliomyelitis, polio. So we need to hear from people who were there, people who even lost members of their family, and not just babies and children, to diseases we hardly hear about today. We'll also hear from some others about some of the fears and misconceptions, both real and invented, about modern vaccination. It seems that there's no end of bad information out there, especially on the internet. But now, let's hear from some people who have seen firsthand the effects of vaccine-preventable diseases. My mother died of TB at the age of 19 and I was 15 months old. I never ever knew her, never knew my mother. And her two brothers in periods, varying periods after that died of the same disease. They, uh, I think one was up to about 10 or 11 years after that. But everybody had it just about, you know, it was, it was just like, Measles was to later to to uh, to the next generation, and um, but they did anyway. Once you get rid of these things, you don't want to get them back. You want, I mean, you want them to stay out, like smallpox and things like that. That we don't have anymore, but we did have them. This is early fifties, and I'm about five or six and I can remember sitting at the, the dining table and there's a doctor talking to my father who's standing up and the doctor's telling my dad, my sister's, my baby sister's got polio and the look of horror on his face and I can hear my mother sobbing in the bedroom because this is the worst possible news. And I remember going up to the Townsville Hospital, the th you know, the three of us to go and visit my, my baby sister, and she's lying in a in a bed in a hospital ward, and, the, and it appeared to my child's brain there were dozens of kids, and this was a polio ward. This wasn't all the illnesses and accidents that were around. This was an entire ward devoted to children. As luck would have it, she was well cared for and she recovered. But I can remember going to school about the same time. And it was after the holidays and we all get back and we're saying hello to kids that we hadn't seen for a few weeks. And, I, and I'm saying, where's Billy? Where's Tommy? And someone said, oh, they've got the polio. And that was all people needed to say because you knew that you'd probably never see them again, and I never did. And I gather that they died. There was a girl in my class um, who had calipers as a result of polio. Uh, I remember s I started that school in first class, so she must have had it when she was much younger. Um, and also I remember a friend of mine's father who'd had polio and he had one really withered leg you know, it was like half the size of, of the, the other leg and he had this funny gait uh, to sort of accommodate for that. Yeah. Well, when I was 11, that was 1951, uh, I just felt very sick one day at school. I went home and my mother did what all good mothers would do, put a child to bed. I had a very high fever and my back was aching. I was really very, very sick. The doctor was called and I can remember the doctor checking out arms and legs bending and also the doctor asked me to sit up which was very painful and to put my chin on my chest and um, I couldn't do that 
and immediately he said to my parents, she must go to hospital. It was the Wagga Base Hospital, it was 25 miles away, 40 kilometres away, and uh, a spinal tap revealed that I had polio. This was absolutely horrifying because there hadn't been any cases of polio in my little town at all. There'd been one in the country, a, a young fellow aged 34, a farmer, and he died. And the whole town was reeling. And now here was Monica with polio. Where did I get it from? Nobody knows. Well, my mother was uh, a nurse before marriage. and She nursed in isolation hospitals. And she saw children dying of uh, tuberculosis, uh, polio, uh, diphtheria and uh, other diseases. She, uh, my father was the eldest of uh, five children. When he was 20 in 1939, his only sister, the youngest in the family, died of diphtheria at the age of two and a half. So I was brought up with stories of kids dying of uh, diphtheria, those my mother had seen and, and of course my father's experience. I'm the oldest of six children. When the youngest was born, we had whooping cough. I remember my little baby sister gasping for breath, a little surg black surgical belt around her belly holding in her navel, which had become herniated as a result of the, of the strain of the coughing. She was very seriously ill, and these days almost certainly would be uh, hospitalised. But there, my mother having been an ex-nurse, they probably thought that she was as well looked after at home as otherwise. And I remember the uh, whooping cough, the <laughs> and then the coughing, and then the uh, the vomiting. It must have been very hard for my mother, just having given birth to a child and having to look after six uh, six kids, <laughs> six kids as well. A personal example from my own family is my cousin Philip. When he was young, he fell over, hurt his leg, came back to his parents and said, I've got a sore leg. They panicked. Their first thought was polio. Took him to the doctor, no problem at all. All he'd done was hurt himself from falling over. Two days later, his very best friend Frank, who lived two streets away, had the same experience. He fell over, sore leg. His parents took him to the doctor, polio. Frank died in 2012. He'd spent his life in a wheelchair. This was a very, very scary disease, and people were very, very worried about it, with, with good cause. I remember when I was in Nimbin working as a medical student helping a doctor, and in came, so I was just work experience, you know, part of the medical rotation, and in came two parents and this kid, 16-year-old kid. Obviously, from the way he was walking, he had polio. It was a very characteristic walk, quite different from a Parkinson's walk, from a stroke walk, quite obvious. And we looked at each other and we didn't say a single thing, the doctor and I. And then they went through the story about how they just come back from India. And then the doctor asked a few questions and he said, um, and have you been vaccinated against polio? No. And he said, okay. And then he did a few tests. And then he said, look, it's pretty obvious to me uh, that your child has polio. And the parents got oh so upset. They didn't want to believe. They, they started firstly being rational and saying things like, well, th there's no such disease as polio. And then they started saying things like, well, um, polio doesn't exist anymore because we all live better. There, there is no infectious disease such as polio and uh, you can't get it. Um, and then they started kicking chairs a little bit and then stormed out. They did not want to live with the fact that by not vaccinating their kid against polio, they had then paralysed their kid in one leg by taking him to India. So at Wagga Bay's hospital, uh, there really was no treatment for a person with polio. I had a high fever and I was just put onto a flat bed, no pillow, and told to stay there. And I, can, I was too sick to go anywhere anyway. So I just stayed there and eventually uh, I was moved out onto a veranda because more people needed to be inside. People who no longer had a fever were being moved on to verandas. I mean unenclosed verandas with just gauze and blind down. But always near me was a horrible barrel looking thing which they said to me was an iron lung. And they said that I might need that because the polio I had was in the throat and in my speech.
I couldn't swallow, couldn't talk properly. And that's the one that tends to go down into the lungs very quickly. And so um, I was really thrilled one day when the, the iron lung wasn't there because I thought, oh, good, I don't need it anymore. But of course, somebody did. And I can remember the 50s where people lived in dread of these terrible illnesses that just took so many people. Walk through an old cemetery and look at the headstones of who died and how old, and you're looking at babies that died. And that's, that's basically all gone, all gone. At the beginning of the 20th century, infant mortality in Australia was over 10%. Can you imagine it? More than one in 10 babies died, many of those from vaccine preventable diseases. What would their parents have given to protect their children? Reports like these were commonplace in the newspapers of the time. It was sad, but no surprise to anyone. Over the course of the 20th century, important health measures were introduced that saw this mortality rate plummet. Chief amongst these was widespread vaccination. I'd like to read to you something I discovered while I was doing research for this documentary. And this comes from the Perth Daily News, dated April 1903. Coughing dislocates a neck. In certifying a child's death to the Southwark coroner, a medical man reports that the deceased had been under treatment for whooping cough. Death was due to a broken neck and in the absence of any definable cause, the doctor was forced to the conclusion that the child dislocated its neck during a violent fit of coughing. I remember when I was in the first batch of kids in Wollongong to get vaccinated. We all got put on buses in primary school and then got shipped down to the Pioneer Hall and then they stabbed all of us. And in my class, there was a kid who had calipers and there were two more kids in the school who had been hit by polio. Polio only gets about half a percent of everybody that infects. So it infects a population, but only about half a percent of them actually come down with the neurological symptoms. And these were the three kids from our school. And it was only years later... So I realised that all the parents standing around had deliberately, as an act of the society, given up the chance to have them vaccinated and protected against polio so that we, their children, could get saved. What a, what a generous bunch of parents they were. About a year after my sister came home, there was an announcement that a vaccine had been invented for polio. And... It was like a huge cloud had been lifted from the suburbs because there's, there's, there'd been this cloud of gloom and doom. It was the dread that your child would be the next to come down with polio. And at last there was hope. And it, very soon after, all of us kids were taken up to the school and we were lined up on the verandas, about 100 of us, and we all got our jabs. And polio just disappeared. The gloom had lifted, and it wasn't even a subject for discussion anymore. And you saw the occasional child or adult with calipers and so on, but that's all there was. Polio just disappeared as if it was magic, but it wasn't magic. It was science at work. These days, the decision to vaccinate is not a hard one, but some people aren't convinced. In a way, vaccination has become a victim of its own success, with people wondering why. Why in this day and age, why would they vaccinate? Because diseases like whooping cough, although dramatically decreased, are still with us and are still claiming lives. And yet there are people, especially in developed countries with low rates of infection, who are vehemently opposed to vaccination, claiming it's responsible for everything from autism to SIDS to even shaken baby syndrome. Unbelievably, some people deny vaccination has prevented any disease whatsoever. There's almost no data for, for significant damage caused by vaccines, any more than anyone having an injection of any sort. Most of those reactions to injections are caused by fainting. If your child's not vaccinated, it's fine so long as no one else comes to this country and brings a disease with them. If someone comes in from another country or the virus gets away some other way, then it's possible that an epidemic can occur. 
And of course, most of these, Ill many of these illnesses, perhaps not all of them, but many of these illnesses are life-threatening. And if you have 15% of the uh, infant population getting a disease like measles, you're going to have deaths. And there'll be a number of deaths. Measles can be a, um, is a life-threatening illness. And of course, polio much more so. Tetanus, diphtheria, uh, whooping cough. Whooping cough you know, has quite a high mortality. And of course, polio has a very high mortality and a very long morbidity. And so if, you, if we have fifth, suddenly have 15% of our population susceptible to these illnesses, um, then of course, you know, all sorts of disasters can occur for, for the children. And so you, by not vaccinating your child, you not only put your own child at risk, but you put at risk the children who have also gone to the trouble of being vaccinated. Because some of them, because of the immune system or whatever, will actually be susceptible to the disease. One of the persistent myths about vaccines and the dangers of vaccines is that vaccination causes autism, or certain vaccines cause autism. There have been dozens of studies done that have shown no connection. What the connection is, or is simply coincidence. Autism is detected at about the age when some of the earlier vaccines are given. It's not something you can usually detect early, but some, in some cases you can. There's just been a recent study done with um, an analysis of as many studies as you could find by an academic from Sydney University. And what he found was that when you put them all together and collected all the information, it just became stronger. There is no connection between vaccination and autism. So it can be, it can be detected early, but the normal type of detection, and it's just to do, normally to do with the developmental stages of children, that they don't show the signs of autism until they're about sometimes like two or three years old. And that's when they start to get a lot of the vaccines. It's a myth, and it's a myth which should be stomped on and should stop it being repeated. But there's people out there who are, are bitterly opposed to vaccination, and they have all sorts of reasons. They object to the science, they object to the, the socialisation of it. But the thing is, they don't know what it's like. I'm one of the last of the generation that saw these things right up close. I saw it in my father's face. I saw it in my mother's. I saw, I saw it in my school friends who wore calipers or just I never saw again. It just doesn't happen today. Why are these people so bitterly opposed to vaccination? They don't know what they're talking about. It's, they have all these reasons that just don't make sense. It's, they're just rubbish. Get your child vaccinated. See a real doctor, not a crank. See a real doctor. Get their immunisation program, get them up to date, keep them up to date, and you won't see what I saw when I was five years old. The first thing to realise about vaccinations is that they were invented by human beings. They're not perfect. Nothing made by humans is perfect. But overwhelmingly, the odds are in your favour if you get vaccinated. I've got my kids vaccinated. I tell everybody to get their kids vaccinated. They're not perfect. You'll have a fever, uh, maybe maybe some something else. But they, overwhelmingly, the odds are in your favour, simply because nothing made by humans is perfect. But the odds are in your favour. Get vaccinated. It's so important. Like, just, just a, a little needle, and then their children... They've taken away all the worry against them getting these things. You think they might die. I remember two, two of my children having um, whooping cough together. And that was, that was a very worrying time. If our grandmothers knew that there was a treatment or prevention for the diseases that their children died from and we weren't accessing those, they would kick us from here into next week. The diseases we've been talking about can affect children for the rest of their lives. Even when all the symptoms are gone, part of the disease can linger in the body for decades only to return later in life. A very nasty visitor from the past. Now poliomyelitis, polio, infantile paralysis, it's been called too, uh, involves the uh, muscles, it involves the paralysis of the muscles and often these are the muscles of the lungs, the breathing apparatus in a person that's affected. So in order for a person to stay alive it was necessary to put polio victims into an iron lung and this forced the air into and out of a person. 
And for many, many people lying on their back, flat on their back, looking at the world through a mirror, uh, eating in there was their life. Many people who went into iron lungs never ever came out of iron lungs. But many people did spend their entire life in there. And they might have been allowed out just a little while with assisted breathing to have a shower, have a bath, a sponge bath, uh, go to the toilet perhaps. But most spent their lives after they were in an iron lung uh, and stayed there. I understand that very few came out of them. In some hospitals there were rooms full of iron lungs helping people to breathe with that awful sound of, of compression and uh, like a pump going to, to pump uh, air into to people and out of people. I think they've been refined in recent times. I don't know what they're used because there's just not the incidence of polio around. But it was certainly a horrific thing to see an iron lung waiting for you at the end of your bed. And this is what you may need. And uh, I was very determined to get well so I didn't need an iron lung. <laughs> One of our latest vaccines or newest vaccines has been the herpes zoster virus vaccine which is the herpes zoster is the virus that causes chickenpox and can recur later and, and come out as, uh, as uh, shingles which is a rather nasty inflammation in, of the skin. So children or people who are infected with chickenpox, the chickenpox virus after the illness is over, the chickenpox virus doesn't completely leave us. It it, uh, it hides in the in the roots of our nerves, in what's called the ganglia of the nerve. So you have a nerve which goes to your fingertips, say, or say to your chest, and that nerve arises in your spinal cord, and back near your spinal cord, there's the the, the nerve ganglion, and so the the uh, the virus will retreat there until for some reason your immunity drops enough or something happens to you, there's some stressor, and the virus will then migrate along the nerve to where the nerve ends on your skin and burst through and attack your skin causing blistering and pain and a nasty rash and uh, so you'll get a patch of a patch of, uh, of blistered burnt skin. Now this can be very unpleasant anywhere but it can sometimes occur on the face if it occurs on the face you can get scarring and disfigurement and it can even sometimes affect the eye and you can get herpes zoster in, in the eye and you can cause loss of vision. Now that can be quite a, a nasty late consequence of, of infant infection with say herpes zoster virus or chicken pox. Many people think oh chicken pox is a benign illness, all my family had it in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s and you know, none of them had anything, any problem. Well, Mostly that's the case, but two things. One is that um, there is still the odd case of um, herpes zoster pneumonia and children have died from herpes zoster lung infection when everyone thought they just had a, you know, the ordinary old chicken pox. But then much later on, when those same infected people reach their 60s, 70s and 80s, they can burst out with a nasty dose of shingles. And it's hoped that the herpes zoster virus by preventing chicken pox, preventing the, um, the actual seeding of these viruses into our nerves that this, we won't be susceptible to um, those bouts of shingles in later life. When my son was five weeks old he contracted viral meningitis and I spent five sleepless nights in the hospital um, listening to him cry and he was bright red and you could just tell he was so afraid and it was, it was a really stressful time for me. He had a spinal tap. You don't, you don't want to have that happen to a tiny little baby. And to think that there are babies out there that you know, might contract a vaccine preventable disease, uh, just, it, it, it terrifies me. And that's why I vaccinate because I want to protect my kids and I want to protect other people's kids. If there was a vaccine for viral meningitis, I would have given that to my both of my kids, no question. To, it was just an awful thing to experience and I really don't want to wish that on any other parent or any other child to go through that. You have an important decision to make whether to vaccinate or not. And that makes you very lucky. For the luxury of having this decision was not available to most of your ancestors and is still not available to parents in many developing parts of the world. I hope you remember the stories from the people in this video 
I hope you'll never know the fear and the sorrow that was part of their lives. And I hope you'll never have to say, if only. <laughs>